Hello, everybody. This is John Elif, and today is March the 2nd, uh, 2006, and with us today is John Vasa, and John Vasa is a war World War II veteran, and he's going to tell us about his uh, life and times as a serviceman in World War II. Then I was a truck driver at Salt Lake City, or just outside of Salt Lake City, for seven months. I uh, did various truck driving jobs, but it was basically a job from uh, roughly 8 to 5, or if we was working the night shift, it was from 5 to 7. Uh, but it was uh, just an ordinary job. What, what were you hauling? Just everything? We hauled everything. We hauled troops from Union Station to Kearns, which was about 15 miles. We hauled groceries from Ogden, Quartermaster Depot. We hauled troops to the rifle range at Fort Douglas. Uh, I also drove an engineer truck for two weeks. Uh, it was various duties. It was interesting duties. So how long did you do that? It was seven months that I was there. Seven months. And, and then what did they do to you? Then they sent me to post headquarters to take a battery of tests. And nobody seemed to know what all these tests were about. Uh, the, <laughs> and I was the only one taking them. And uh, when I got done, I asked the sergeant in charge, what's it all about? And uh, he said, Darned if I know, but you can go to any school in the Technical Training Command that the Air Corps has. And uh, so I went back to barracks, and about two weeks later, they called me up to headquarters and uh, interviewed me for the Army Specialized Training Program. Another two weeks went by, and I was sent to the University of Utah, which was when we got to Mount Standish, we spent about a week uh, getting more shots, getting the last of our equipment, and life-saving drills. We loaded out of Boston Harbor in the afternoon. The Red Cross donut wagon was there. The band was playing. We got on the ship and I was assigned to F deck, which was the farthest hold forward and down as deep as you could go in the ship. And the bunks were about 18, inch, 18 inches apart, and they were five high. Uh, every time that ship went over a wave, over a fairly good wave, you went clear up in the air and then came down with a big thump. So you didn't get too much sleep. The fed us twice a day after about two days, there was so many seasick and that dining room was smelled so awful you couldn't eat there. Uh, after 10 days of this, we arrived in Plymouth, England. We unloaded, took a train to a town the name of Dorchester, England. Here we stayed in English barracks. They were small, basically hutments. This was in October, and it was chilly, but the only stoves these things had in them was about the size of a 10-gallon cream can, and burned briquettes that didn't start burning very good and then just kind of smoldered along. We were there almost a month and did basically 
conditioning exercises. Conditioning marches usually about five to seven miles in the morning. Uh, after being there a month, we took a train to Portsmouth, England, loaded on an English boat. The name of it was the Empire Lance and went across the channel to La Harve. They served us a meal on this English boat. The liquid they served us was indistinguishable from, indistinguishable from whether it was coffee, tea, dishwasher, or what. <laughs> Terrible, huh? Uh, it was terrible. We arrived, arrived in La Harve after an overnight trip. We arrived in the morning, but they wouldn't unload us in the daytime because of possible air raids. We unloaded that evening after dark over the side with our full barracks bags, our weapons, and over the side on rope nets into a, a smaller landing ship infantry. That took us to the dock and we uh, unloaded off of it. How many men were on that ship, would you guess? The one that we went overseas on, there were probably, uh, I would guess, uh, 1,500. It wasn't a big ship, it was a new ship, and it was our understanding that it was built to be used in the banana trade after the war. Uh, it was a clean ship because it was its first voyage carrying troops. Uh, I can't say how clean it was when we got done with it, <coughs> but... Uh, it was better than some that we heard of. Uh, another thing about this, we went over in a convoy, supposedly one of the biggest convoys that went across the Atlantic in the fall of 44. When we got up in the morning, we got to go up on deck. As far as you could see, any way we looked from our ship was just masts, ships and masts. Uh, and yet, every morning when we got up in those eight or nine days it took us, our position was the same to the next ship as it was the day before. It never varied. We were in the same line, the same place. We stayed in in La Harve just, well actually we loaded on trucks that night yet and they hauled us out to some little town probably three or four hours out from La Harve and uh, we unloaded in the dark, of course, in what turned out to be a beet field. The, it, we thought it was beets, but they were actually mangles used for cow feed, but they were stacked in piles. The ground was quite muddy, and it seemed like from there on, everything we did was in the dark and in the mud. <laughs> uh, we stayed there about two days. We uh, got rid of our barracks bag and everything we hauled overseas except what we could carry. I, carry, I uh, wore long underwear, two pair OD pants, two OD shirts, a Red Cross sleeveless sweater, long sleeves uh, sweater, a poncho, which was a type of raincoat, helmet, rifle, small pack, mess kit, 
canteen, first aid back. I think that was about it, but that was enough. The rest of it we put in barracks bags, and they told us to get back, they catch up with us later. Unfortunately, they never did. Uh, included in those barracks bags was most of our personal stuff outside of shaving cream, toilet articles, anything personal went in those barracks bags. So we never saw any of that again. Uh, from there we boarded trucks and rode about 250 miles to Belgium. About uh, 30 miles from the German border. At that particular time, the front line was just past the German border. We unloaded again in the dark, in the rain, and uh, put up our tents, stayed there a couple days, and then we were to move up to the front to the front lines. The trucks came to get us and it started to snow. <laughs> it was about an hour's ride, or a little better, to where we were to get off the trucks. By the time we got to where we were to unload, there was probably four inches of snow on the ground. And it was a heavy, wet snow. Our first duty, I, I'll go back a bit. When I joined the 99th, I was assigned a little handheld radio, uh, the SCR 536. Each platoon of 40 men carried one of these radios. Uh, they aren't little like we know them now. They were about 18 inches tall, about 6 inches square. They used two long batteries. I was given a, a what they called a messenger bag to carry extra sets of batteries in. So beside my regular load, I had this messenger bag with my radio and my batteries in it. When we got to the front lines, we had no idea what we were getting in. It was woods and fairly steep hills. It was planted forests. And these forests were all the way from mature trees to seedling trees three or four feet high. The mature trees were trimmed up underneath uh, pretty well so you could see underneath them. They were trimmed probably 10 feet high, but anything around 15 feet high had all the leaves on it. You could hardly crawl through them. We went on the front line and it was basically an outpost line because our foxholes were about 100 yards apart, which is a lot further than you'd like to have them. Uh, but it was a quiet front. There wasn't much activity here. And it was thought that it would be a good place for us to get some further training. We went on patrols, we rotated going on these patrols. The patrol went out every day. It might be a recon patrol of only six or seven people, or it might be a combat patrol of 40 people. But the idea was, the recon patrols was to see what the Germans were up to and the combat patrols was to try to engage them in some sort of a firefight. It was about two and a half to three miles to the German lines. They had the pillboxes, they had the Siegfried line, and we were just dug in along a creek. 
uh, we stayed, we took turns there. We'd stay on this uh, line about a week, and then a platoon would relieve our platoon, and we would get to go back to town and supposedly to rest, but uh, they always had us doing something, some work. Uh, we'd dig uh, fortifications, fallback positions. They didn't believe in letting us sleep. <laughs> uh, this went on for another month. We rotated back and forth. I think we rotated a couple times. Then our company, our regiment, was to attack in conjunction with the second division to capture some dams that had to be captured before the army could continue. We were loaded in trucks and moved about 23 miles or so. And uh, prepared to attack these pillboxes on the Siegfried line. We uh, moved out in stages. We moved part way, then we moved a little further. And it was probably three miles that we moved before we came to the pillboxes. Before we got to them, we dropped everything but our weapons, our cartridge belts, and our poncho. We, we dropped our mess kits, our blankets. We proceeded on to, towards these pillboxes. We got to where they was just over the, over the hill. And this was rough ground, for, heavily forested with some open spaces. My platoon leader, and of course I carried his radio, I had to stay with him all the time, and his two scouts and a squad leader went on a recon patrol to see how best to get at these pillboxes. We went over the hill, had a good view of the pillbox, it was pretty well overgrown, and uh, decided, well, we got to get a little closer. We tried to get a little closer, and uh, the Germans opened up on us with a machine gun. We went back over the hill. We didn't get hit. I broke the antenna off my radio. I didn't break it off. I banned it so it wouldn't retract. But anyway, we went back over the hill and uh, reported that, hey, this ain't going to be any fun. Uh, by that time, it was about sundown. It was getting close to sundown. And uh, they decided to wait till tomorrow, the next day. Uh, we uh, tried to bed down on the side of this fairly steep hill. We had no blankets. We had only this rubber poncho, this raincoat type affair. And it was freezing weather. It was below freezing. We had no hot meals. We had K rations. The next morning we get up and they tell us that we're going to take a different pillbox. We're going to do it at noon. And it was probably 500 yards away from the original. This pillbox in front of it had barbed wire about 10 feet high and about 8 feet wide, coiled up, tangled. Then an open space of about 200 yards, mined, and then the pillbox. 
Now the rest of the platoon had trained with Bangalore torpedoes, which were tubes about two inches around, filled with uh, TNT that you could put under barbed wire, shove them under there. They came in five foot sections and you could connect them together and uh, set them off and blow a hole in the wire. We had a flamethrower, a portable flamethrower. We had satchel charges, which were 50 pound packets of TNT in uh, basically a, a satchel type deal. We had pole charges that were 50 pound TNT on about a 10 foot pole. The idea was that would blow the doors or the embrasures of these pillboxes with these when you got close enough. Uh, well, when the attack started, they blew the barbed wire. Another man with wire cutters was clipping the wire to make wider so it wouldn't snag you going through. The flamethrower man went through, tried his flamethrower and didn't work. He threw it away. The pole chargers, the pole charge men, they dropped their poles. The satchel charge man made it up there and threw his satchel charge in the embrasure. It went off and blew the machine gun off the mount. Uh, the Germans in the meantime, the rest of us came up. The Germans, and there were, I think, seven or eight in there, uh, surrendered, came out the door. Uh, the excitement of this first attack, the, it is indescribable. The adrenaline, I think, flows so bad so hard, you get so excited. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. I don't think it's describable. Anyway, we captured the pillbox. The same evening, another platoon of our company captured the pillbox that we originally looked at because they were able to come at it from the back. Uh, we got to stay in that pillbox that night, our platoon, because we captured it. Company headquarters, the first sergeant tried to stay in it, but the commanding officer says, no, we capture it, they get to stay in it, you go out in the woods. <laughs> Fair the enough. <laughs> first sergeant was very unhappy. He went on sick call, and that's the last we ever saw of him. The next morning, no, I'll take that back. That night, the engineers carried TNT into this pillbox. These pillbox walls were eight, 10, 12 feet thick of concrete. They carried TNT into this pillbox that made a stack about five foot tall and probably five foot square to blow this thing up. The next morning we heard that the bulge started. We heard that there was a heavy attack to our immediate right. And we were to pull back. So we started walking out of there. Uh, we was probably a quarter mile away when this pillbox blew, so we never got to see the results of it. But I made a pretty good noise. I bet. Uh, we uh, retreated, and I probably shouldn't use the word retreat. We fell back to new positions because the Army never retreated. Uh, and we kept digging new positions. Uh, basically, small slit trenches. We weren't seeing any enemy, but we were getting these reports. 
of heavy fighting to our right and we could hear a lot of artillery fire and small arms fire to our right. We kept retreating by steps, usually about, I would say, uh, 500 yards, and kept getting these reports of German patrols in the vicinity of 40-man combat patrols, 50-man patrols. Uh, we never did see them. This was pretty scary because we didn't, the reports we were getting on our radios and not knowing what was really happening and knowing we were going backwards uh, did not sit too well with us. Nothing we could do about it. The next day we again pulled back some more. The platoon leader and I went to company headquarters were called there and they told us that our platoon would probably have to aid the regiment to our right. Uh, we were to get ready to get into some pretty rough combat there. Uh, while the lieutenant was talking to the CO, I was looking around in the area I was carrying an M1 rifle at the time and it was quite heavy, quite awkward to carry the radio and the rifle. And besides, my rifle was all dirty and pitted. There was a tent abandoned by some service outfit that had probably a hundred rifles in it. I was going to take one of them and then I thought, oh, maybe they disabled them, I better not. Another tent had Christmas mail in it, Christmas packages that was abandoned. It was uh, about a 10 by 12 tent and I would say there were Christmas packages stacked about two feet deep across one end of that, abandoned. Since we didn't have to attack, we got the order again that we would move out, but we had to destroy everything that we couldn't carry, which included the company jeep. The infantry company only had two jeeps. That's all the transportation they had. Uh, I remember the executive officer of the company going over to this company jeep while we were still there, opening the little toolbox and taking out a quart of whiskey and saying, I'm not gonna let him have this. And he took and broke it over the back of the jeep. And uh, then they set the jeep on fire. We did. We walked out, the battalion, in fact there were two companies of us, after dark, off to our left by less than half a mile there was the biggest tank fight, tank fire, buildings burning, cattle bawling, uh, small arms fire that I've ever seen before or since. It was the biggest 4th of July celebration I ever saw. Uh, the Germans had patrols all over and they would fire off flares, white flares, that would light up the area just like daylight. Our orders were when a flare went off to stop dead still because if you stood still, most likely you wouldn't be seen as if you moved around. We walked till about 11 o'clock, got to where some of our people were digging in a line, were told that we weren't supposed to come out to go right back in. We turned around and we walked back in. 
It was our understanding then, when we went back in, that we were cut off. We couldn't find our original holes that we came from because it was so dark in that forest that the only way we could keep track of each other was to hang on to each other. The lieutenant and I scraped away a few pine needles, threw down our ponchos, and we were so tired we fell asleep. The next morning we woke up way before morning with an artillery broads that seemed right on top of us. It wasn't, it was close. It was our own artillery and supposedly filling a gap to keep the Germans from getting to us. We stayed in that position all day. That, that night we finally moved out. We, we walked about 10 miles to get out to the town of Elsenborn. We got out about 3 o'clock in the morning, dark, artillery firing, our own artillery firing around us at the Germans. We thought we were safe. We lit up cigarettes. We didn't worry about fire. We, we was home free. Unfortunately, that was not the case. The next morning, we did get a hot meal, the first one in about three days. But no sooner did that meal get fed than German artillery started dropping on us. We moved downhill a ways and dug in, tried to protect ourselves. We stayed there the rest of the day, the next night. In the morning, about 10 o'clock, the mess sergeant brought us a meal again. Our line of holes was right next to where he set up the chow line, where he set up the marmite cans. We got to eat, but some of the troops behind us were still in line when German artillery started coming in. Our holes were not very deep. Me and the lieutenant was in one hole, and when the artillery came in, about five people piled in on top of us because that was the nearest hole to the chop line, ch chow line. Eventually, the artillery let up. The one thing I would say there, about 150 feet, less than 200 feet from us was an American artillery piece firing at the Germans, uh, 105. Those boys never hesitated. They never laid up. They never took cover. They kept firing away. I have to give it to the artillery. They did a job. Break. We went back from these positions into the town of Elsenborn. We moved into a schoolhouse. The town itself was under heavy artillery fire. We stayed in the basement for a part of the day. Then we moved out to be a reserve for some other troops. We walked probably five miles. We get out to the woods and we were to wait there for the 9th Infantry Division troops to come in. We were in fairly mature woods. The Catholic chaplain came out and of course we were spread out five yards apart, scattered over the probably two acres. He said mass for us. And then we went 
on after the 9th Division troops came down the road. We moved to an open area and dug a series of holes and reserve uh, backup troops for the front line troops about probably a half a mile behind the front line. We stayed in these positions over Christmas and over New Year's, I think to about the 6th of January of 44. Uh, we, got, we couldn't move in the daytime without drawing artillery fire. We got Christmas dinner. It was plentiful, but it was stone cold. <laughs> we got New Year's dinner. It was plentiful. It was stone cold. We got Christmas mail. The first mail that I had gotten since about the 10th of December, or that any of us had gotten. But it was a lot of Christmas packages in this mail. In the situation we had just been in, and the situation we were in, the presents, some of the presents we got were, to say the least, hilarious. Uh, I got a framed picture of one of my girlfriends. No way to carry it. I got a, ten, a number 10 can full of popcorn with a pint of whiskey inside of it. Uh, managed to take care of that right quick like, didn't have to carry it. Uh, but. There was all kinds of stuff, books and stuff like that we couldn't, absolutely couldn't use. And yet the thought, the thought was there. We left there about the 6th of January, snow on the ground. Uh, and the snow on the ground started about the 15th of December for us. And we never was out of snow, but it got bad in January. We moved to a front line position where the Germans were in the woods about a half a mile away from us. And we were on a bare open hill, dug in in holes. The, we couldn't move in the daytime at all without drawing sniper fire. We received Harassing artillery fire, you never knew when you was going to have artillery fire coming in on you. The snow got deeper and it got colder. We were dug in these holes. I never shaved and none of my platoon that I was in shaved or took a bath, got a chance to take a bath from the 1st of December till the first week in February. We burned gasoline. Our platoon would get a five gallon can of gasoline and a five gallon can of water. And it would also get loaves of bread from the quartermaster bakery. The platoon sergeant would divide up the bread, slice it up for each squad, half a loaf or however. At the time we were on this position where our full strength of the platoon was about 39 men, we were down to 18. We had lost men, we had lost two killed on the pillbox thing. We had lost about five wounded there. We had lost people with uh, trench foot, frozen feet, frozen hands. Yet we had very little trouble with colds or pneumonia or anything like that. Want me to continue? Yeah. We stayed there 
most of January, and the snow got deeper, got drifts actually, three or four feet deep drifts. The platoon had to send out patrols, not very often, but oh, about once every three or four days you had to send out a reconnaissance patrol to try to figure out whether the Germans were still there or what they were doing. Uh, it was dangerous stuff. It, it was night patrols, mostly. We moved out of there about uh, last week in January and uh, went into a reserve position for the 9th Division. In the meantime, other troops had been attacking the Germans and getting rid of the, the bulge, the area that had been captured by them. We had one final small attack to go on there. By that time, the ground was thawing, the snow was melting, the water was running everywhere. Uh, we used we used weasels, tracked vehicles. The medics used them for evacuation. We had a horse and a sleigh when the snow was on the ground uh, to haul supplies down from the uh, town of Elsenborn. And when we moved out of there after that attack and that attack went well. We attacked to our original positions where we first moved to Germany. The Germans had used our holes and our big uh, dugouts that we made for warming places. They used them for shelters for their horses. So they had manure in them. We moved out of there and we moved to the town of Hollerath, which was on the other side of the Siegfried line, the pillbox, that was just inside the German side of the pillboxes. These had been captured by other troops. We run patrols again, basically recon patrols to see what the Germans were up to. We received artillery fire, but we were in towns and in buildings, so we didn't manage to stay halfway warm. From there we went back, which supposedly this is about the 6th or 7th or 8th of February of 44, 45. We were to go back for a rest. So we walked about 10 miles and rode about 5 miles in trucks to a little town, but we were happy. Uh, we had been issued quarter pound blocks of TNT and uh, caps earlier to use to break the ground in case we had to dig holes, slip trenches or foxholes. We would take a little hole down in the frozen ground and put in this quarter pound block of TNT and set it off and, and it would fracture the frozen ground enough that we could dig it out. Uh, most of us didn't have to use them. So when we got back to this little town, there was a nice little creek rolling through it. We used our quarter pound blocks of TNT to fish. <laughs> Worked good. <laughs> we were to get a rest here. Unfortunately, the army roads were going to pieces so they would detail, draft 20 or 30 of us at a time to go demolish buildings or help the engineers demolish buildings for rubble to fill potholes in soft spots in the road. Uh, I got on one of those details. Uh, 
you have to understand that uh, manpower was plentiful and machines weren't, so you loaded bricks into trucks by hand, or you went to the quarry and loaded rocks by hand for them to, uh, the engineers to uh, fill the potholes. It wasn't uh, our idea of a rest. But we did get back to a rest. Further back, we stayed in uh, a little town with civilians in their houses. These were Belgian civilians. We got to take showers. We got three hot meals a day. We, uh, I got a three-day pass to Liège while I was there. Break. Uh, when I got back from rest, uh, leave at Liège, the company had moved out to attack across the Roar River towards the Rhine River. When I caught up with them, in the first place, when I left on to go on leave, I wanted to get rid of that radio. I turned it over to another man in the company. When I came back from leave, I stopped at the supply room and instead of picking up the carbine that I had been carrying, I picked up an M1 rifle because I wasn't going to carry that radio. Uh, I get back to the company. It's dug in along an anti-tank tank embankment. They'd had a rough day of it. It lost about four wounded and two or three killed. Uh, as soon as my platoon leader saw I was back, he says, why aren't you getting the radio? I don't want the radio. You're going to carry the radio. That, and he used a lot of obscenities referring to the man that was carrying it. Uh, don't know anything about it. He says, you got to carry it. So I was stuck with that radio the rest of the time. I did manage to get rid of my M1 and get the carbine back, though. Uh, we attacked that night. It wasn't much of an attack. We just entered the woods and dug in for the night. The next morning we attacked another about 500 yards through the woods to the edge of the woods. They weren't that heavy. We're digging in and the platoon leader, Lieutenant Jurassic, and myself always, dug, we paired up, we dug the hole together and we stayed in the same hole. The platoon sergeant and the platoon guide were part of our headquarters of the platoon, and they stayed together. And they dug their hole together. We were digging our holes. We had them basically done about 20 feet apart. When an artillery shell came in, hit the base of a tree, and hit Lieutenant McNamara, our platoon sergeant. A piece of shrapnel went through him right at the waist, clipped his watch band off, it went flying, uh, but it killed him. He was a best, one of the best men we had. He was from Pennsylvania. He had hands that I think if he had a 14 size glove, it would, might fit his hands. He was a big man and he was a, he was a prince. We moved back from there that evening to a town of Bergheim. Stayed there overnight in houses. A big 
155 self propelled gun, or artillery gun, was firing the house right next to us. The artillerymen were throwing everything out of their house, including the kitchen sink. They were making room for themselves. <laughs> but we didn't get too much sleep with that gun going off every 10 minutes or so. The next morning we moved out and attacked. We moved about 15 miles by truck and then started attacking through small towns. There wasn't much resistance, just usually a few troops that was willing to surrender. We uh, ended up in a little town uh, overnight. We stayed in buildings. Uh, the next day we still stayed there, cleaned up, made sure that the, there weren't any German soldiers in the town. The next morning at three o'clock in the morning, in the very dark, we moved for attack to the Rhine River. We didn't have any trouble getting to the Rhine River. We ended up right on the river bank is like training unit, a classification center. From there I was, I took some more tests and was shipped to the University of Arkansas to take a basic engineering course. This, what, what did that engineering course amount to? That was it? This basic engineering course was quite rigorous. Uh, it amounted to a three three month terms and each term was at least equivalent to a semester of college work. Wow. And uh, uh, carrying a total counting military drill and physical training of 24 hours. We went to school five and a half hours, pardon me, five and a half days a week. And we had a uh, regimented study hall on Sunday evening, plus the regimented study halls every evening from around eight to 10. What were some of the subjects, for instance, was it math and structure took, or what was it? We took math, uh, trigonometry, advanced algebra, calculus. Wow. We took physics. Uh, uh, we took chemistry, both organic and in inorganic chemistry. Uh, we took uh, basically familiarization courses in English, history, and geopolitics, geography. You just went to college. Yes, we did. It was a civilian <laughs> thing. Only thing was, uh, it was pretty regimented, at least at the University of Arkansas. Yeah. So, so you were there. Uh, how long was that? I was there from June of '44 to March. Pardon me, June of '43 to March of '44. March of '44. In March of '44 we were told that the program, the Army Specialized Training Program, was being shut down and that we were all being sent to infantry divisions. Oh wow, is that right? It was a real low blow to us. There were about 600 of us at the University of Arkansas and we were all transferred to the 99th Division at Camp Maxey, Texas. I will qualify that because some of the advanced students, and there were probably 25 or 30 of those, um, got to stay on, and the pre-med students got to stay on. But the rest of us that took the basic engineering courses went to Camp Maxey. Into the infantry? Yes. Uh, when we got to Camp Maxey, 
most of the ASTP personnel had to take, a, a, basically had to take basic training over because a lot of them had, had infantry basic. Since I had basic training, I went directly to a line company and I hadn't been there but about five days till I went out on the, in the field on the 10-day problem. Uh, there were two of us that had infantry basic. That was certainly a low blow from college yeah. dormitories to going out in the field that quick. <laughs> Camping out and <laughs> tenting out, huh? Uh, I stayed in Camp Roberts for uh, till uh, September. I stayed with, I was assigned to uh, G Company of the 395th Infantry, which was a line rifle company, and uh, went overseas with them on the 29th of September of 1944. From uh, March till September, we trained here in the States. We trained at Camp Barkley, Texas, near Abilene. Uh, we got a furlough before we went overseas. Uh, but basically, when it was time, we went to Camp Miles Standish outside of Boston and uh, loaded out there for the European Theater of Operations. See there were our soldiers. But one thing about this town, it had a German British prisoner of war camp in it. A British prisoners of war that had been captured in North Africa four years earlier. They were all high ranking as generals and colonels. Uh, interesting people to talk to. We stayed there uh, a day or two and then moved out by truck to close the rear pocket. Here, it was up and down hill, little town after little town, not much resistance, some resistance. I'd lose a man now and then, wounded or what, not, nothing real serious. We closed the rear pocket. Uh, we were holding a, 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 a line around the main part of the troops. They started surrendering. Uh, the road where the company command post was is about a half a mile away from where we were. Uh, where we were holding the line was uh, woods, forests, full of German equipment, abandoned German equipment, trucks, tanks, all kinds of German equipment, American captured equipment. We walked down to company headquarters and uh, there were about five or six German generals that had surrendered down there. We had never seen a German general, so uh, me and the platoon sergeant went over to look at him. There was studied indifference. They looked right through us. They had no words for us. <laughs> Actually, we had no words for them either. But uh, I, I can still remember them absolutely uh, staring through us like we weren't even there. We stood by the road, and by this time, the Germans surrendering had just covered the hillside. I don't know how many. They were coming down this road in all kinds, marching four breaths. They were coming in half tracks, German equipment. 
I remember distinctly a German half track full of troops, and these were high, ungainly looking pieces of equipment. The troops were singing, the driver was driving with one hand and waving a wine bottle, huh. that they were on their way to surrender. We stayed there in that town, we moved into a town, and another soldier from the platoon and I went and scrounged out a couple of uh, Ford one and a half ton trucks, German trucks. And the next morning we were moving out to the Third Army, it was about a 330 mile move, and they let us take our trucks. We started out about four o'clock, and before long it got dark. Well, it had two problems. The executive officer, who was the first lieutenant, decided he wanted to ride in a cab with me. And the other problem was, ahead of me, up the convoy line, was a captured four-ton engineer truck. Now on this road that we were on, it was up and down hills, this engineer truck would go like the devil going downhill and then have to gear way down to go uphill. Well, you can imagine what that did to our convoy. It was just like an accordion. We were either going like a bat out of hell or practically crawling. In the process, sometime towards midnight, I got sleepy and the lieutenant said, Oh, I drive. Okay. So he got behind the wheel and I got in the passenger seat and went to sleep. Before daylight, he woke me up. You better drive. I don't have any brakes. Fine. In a convoy without any brakes? <laughs> So anyway, I took it. I could stop it by gearing it down and uh, managed to stay up till uh, daylight. We stopped for breakfast, and then we abandoned the truck. And I had to ride in the back of them six by six. But <laughs> we went to a little town north of Nuremberg. It was a nice drive. We drove that night with headlights. Uh, because the German lines were way out away from us. We stayed in this little town. It was a, one of the dirtier little German towns I was in. It was in this town that the company medic brought me my Purple Heart that I had received or I had uh, got wounded back the 15th of March, and he brought me the, the orders, and I looked at him, and I was cleaning my carbine at the time, and uh, I had some choice words for him bringing me that at that point in time. <laughs> I, show wait. us that, show us that, okay. Done? So, yeah, so you got the Purple Heart when you were wounded carrying the radio when the... That's why I got it. That's but why, yeah. I didn't actually get this uh, case and medal till then. And I shouldn't have gotten it then. I should have waited till after the war, as I did with most of them. I brought it to him in the field when he was out. Uh, isn't yeah. that right, John? Yes. He, he was at uh, this little town. And the, what was the, med, the medic brought it to you? Yes. Uh huh. And, uh, and they brought it to him just like this, which was yeah, a little uh, unusual, I guess. Very unusual. You got a shot on that? Okay. Uh, we stayed in this little town for probably a day or two and then moved to Nuremberg, just outside of Nuremberg getting ready to attack towards Salzburg, Austria. We started in following the 14th Armored Division. 
So we had pretty easy going for the day. We probably moved 15 miles. Uh, when we uh, stopped for the night, the river ahead of us was the Alt Mule River, and the town that we were to take was Kending. That's K I N D I N G. Sent a recon patrol down there that night to see what all might be there. And it was, the town was in a deep valley, steep cliff above it. We could hear tanks moving down there. We could hear some commotion down there. So we knew that we were most likely in for a fight the next morning. The next morning, the company commander, apparently that since we had reconned the place, sent our platoon to capture it. We got into the town about daylight. The Germans had evacuated. The Germans had left. There were three little bridges in the town. They had blown two of them, and they were on the other side of the river. Uh, some of our men fired at them, but of course they disappeared quick. We were in the town and cleared it out. Uh, orders were to, dis to get all the weapons, German weapons, civilian or otherwise, and destroy them. In this town was some sort of a hunting club. It had beautiful banners, trophies, and rifles, 22 caliber target rifles, beautiful. The elderly gentleman that was in charge of it tried to get us to leave them, but our orders were to take them out and break them up. I don't know how many dollars worth of those rifles, those beautiful target rifles we broke up. We no sooner got that done than artillery and mortars started coming in on us, and they were coming in thick and fast. Uh, the civilians were still in the town. The platoon leader platoon sergeant in charge of the platoon, and I and a couple others were on the one bridge that hadn't been captured, hadn't been destroyed. We backed off and took cover in a cave, basically, in the side of the hill. <coughs> uh, there were probably 12 civilians that came into this cave at the time. The artillery was getting closer. I mean, the explosions sounded like they were right outside the door. These civilians panicked and insisted they were getting out of there. We tried to keep them in there, but they took off. I don't know whatever happened to them. Uh, some civilians in town were wounded. After it led up a bit to where it was only falling about one every 15 minutes or so, I, we went back to the bridge. In the meantime, our battalion had a Negro platoon attached to it. These Negroes were infantrymen and they were volunteers. And they were assigned one platoon to a regiment. Easy Company, our sister company, had this Negro platoon. These Negroes were to take the wooded ground across this creek. They were strung out along the creek right next to our bridge. And those gentlemen actually talked themselves across the creek. 
It was, it was something to watch those colored people talking themselves across that creek. But they showed no fear. That evening we went on across up this hill that they'd captured and went down the other side, took a little uh, outbuilding type structure, crossed the creek in about daylight that was about waist deep, ice cold water. And all this time we had nothing hot to eat or nothing hot to drink. We had K rations. We marched about, I would say, five miles and boarded trucks and went about 10 miles to catch up with armor again. Stayed overnight, went again, finally moved to the Danube River. And this was about 10 o'clock in the morning. We were told that we were going to make a combat crossing of the Danube. We moved down to the river bank, rather the river levee, dropped whatever we had and picked up rowboats, engineer rowboats that held about 12 men, carried them across this levee and into the floodplain of the river. There were, I think, 10 of us and two engineers, one engineer at the front of the boat and one engineer at the back of the boat. We carried it to the river bank, and the river bank was covered with brush, brushy willows, fairly tall grass, and we were to put it in the water, turn it over and put it in the water, row across. We got to the river bank when the Germans from the other side opened up with small arms fire and it was impossible to move any further. One engineer, the front engineer was hit, two of our men were hit, the rest of us went to ground right now, trying to dig into the ground in that brush and uh, willow roots and whatnot. Uh, Needless to say, we got nowhere, and then the artillery, the German, or rather mortar fire, started falling behind us on the embankment or the levee. So we were basically stuck where we were at. We managed to dig a little hole, but if we showed ourselves over the, at the edge of the water where they could see us, we drew rifle fire immediately or machine gun fire. We stayed there all day. I got word in the middle of the afternoon that we would be moving out of there and cross about three miles upstream where another regiment had crossed without any trouble. But we weren't to move out till dark and we were to uh, uh, fire our weapons to let the Germans know we were still there, keep them occupied. Uh, not a very good thought. <coughs> After dark we moved back across the levee and it started raining. And it rained on us all the way down that three mile stretch of river. We got over to where the 393rd Regiment had crossed and uh, got on uh, ducks, those amphibious trucks, to cross the river. Well, we got across the river and then we turn around and we go back to clean out the Germans that stopped us from the other side. So there wasn't much, much rest. We had tankers and TDs helping us, and the Germans that were opposing us here 
were mostly young kids with a few old men. And I mean kids 15 and 16 and 17 years old. But they could fire a rifle. The tankers and some of the battalion intelligence people, I think they were, they were from battalion, that came in with the tankers, were slapping and beating these poor German kids around. The kids were bawling. They should have never been soldiers to start with. But that's war. We rode out of there, walked and rode, walked and rode. They'd walk five miles and ride ten, or walk ten and ride five to the N River. Uh, most of this ground had been captured by other troops, mostly armored divisions. There wasn't any fighting on it until uh, we got to the N River at Mooseburg. Mooseburg was a big German PW camp. It had a lot of our people that were captured in the bulge in it. Uh, they were liberated. Uh, buddies found buddies there. We stayed in the town for a day or so and then crossed the N River on a weir, which is a, a low dam, a, a divergent type dam, and attack a town name of H. It was about a mile of flat ground to it. Uh, we didn't receive much uh, fire till we got into the town and then received artillery fire, time fire, air bursts. That was our last attack. We stayed there overnight, then moved out to a farmhouse. I have these pictures of me. It was taken at this farmhouse. Now, where was this? You, these are you taken across after you crossed the... Uh... This was after we crossed the N River, and these were taken on VE Day. Uh, the war was over for all intents and purposes after we made that last attack. I think that was on the 5th or the 6th of May. So this is VE, this is you and VE Day in... Germany. Yes. Or Austria. Austria. Austria, yeah. Now, after the last attack, we were billeted in a farmhouse uh, not far from the town of H. We policed the woods, cleaned up the woods, uh, some German artillery ammunition, and we destroyed some of it. Uh, about the 9th of May, 10th of May maybe, we loaded on trucks and moved to north of Schweinfurt, Germany, in Bavaria for occupation duty. Uh, this was a pleasant trip. It took us all day. It was about a 200 30 to 250 mile ride. Uh, here we were billeted in a German army training camp, a beautiful place. It was used to house displaced persons. It had probably 10,000 to 15,000 displaced persons in it. These were Russian soldiers, Poles, uh, Czechs, Dutch, Hungarians. And our job, our duty, was to keep these people in the camp. The Russians would break out of the camp in gangs and go to the neighboring German town, towns and uh, 
basically terrorize it. They would steal everything they could. They would kill the sheep and the cattle and uh, bring them back. Uh, so our job was to guard the camp to keep these people in. We had guard posts about every 200 yards. We had guards on the main gate. We had guards on the motor pool gate where we had two Russians and two American soldiers standing guard. The Russians had rifles with live ammunition. They worried not about what was where. They just fired those things regardless. They'd fire right down the road. They, they had no sense of, of any safety anyway. We guarded this thing. We guarded the warehouses. So the warehouses had uh, all kinds of stuff in. I remember distinctly guarding one that had sugar in it. Sugar was a scarce commodity. And the German civilians from the little town next to it would come up and try to beg or barter sugar from whoever the guards were. Uh, and they would get the job done. Uh, I remember uh, following a German civilian around the camp one whole afternoon because civilians were the only ones that knew the waterworks, uh, the septic uh, sanitary sewer works, and uh, his job was apparently to inspect and keep keep this running. But we didn't dare let a civilian into camp with all those Russians around. I was there, our company was there about a month. In the meantime, all those uh, that had high points or those that had low points which was a point system for getting a discharge. The low points went, were transferred to the 1st Division. The high pointers stayed with the 99th. Some of us in between were transferred to different units. We moved from there to Camp Hamelberg, another German PW. I knew I was going to have to leave the 99th, so I talked the company clerk into finding me a cushy job somewhere. Mm -hmm. he said, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> he came in one night and he said, I can get you on as a truck driver in the 83rd Division. Okay. So I transferred to the 83rd Division in, back in Austria. I come from G395, I go to G331, which is a rifle company. And I'm handed a rifle. After uh, about a month of that, not even a month, uh, probably two weeks, we were having a big parade for General Patton. The battalion I was in was the representative battalion for the 83rd Division, and we were practicing 16-man fronts, right turns and left turns on this parade ground. It was a sod airfield. Eight hours a day. One noon we fell out to go practice some more. The company commander says, I need six volunteers. I was so fed up of doing right turns and left turns, I volunteered. He says, go back to your barracks and fall out in Class A uniform and meet a Major Baldwin at the edge of the airfield. I did. I get up there and Major Baldwin is from the 99th Division. He'd been transferred. He was uh, operations uh, officer. 
And as soon as he seen my 99th patch, I was in. I mean, he picked me to go to regimental headquarters. I spent the rest of the war, which wasn't very much, the 4th of July to September with regimental headquarters of the 331st. The 6th of September, I got a furlough to Switzerland for seven days, which was really enjoyable. I got back from the Switzerland furlough the 13th, and I was transferred to a, an engineer outfit to start home. It took from the 13th of September till the end of November waiting for transportation, waiting for a boat to get me home. What year was that, John? 1945. I was uh, discharged the 6th of December in 1945. And that's about it. I'm going to ask him. Okay. So how, how old were you when you finished the war? 24. 24? Yes. So you'd been in the service? Three years, three months, and six days. Yeah, right. And <laughs> almost constantly in combat. No, about uh, seven months of combat. Yeah. Fourteen months in the infantry, not counting uh, my basic training. Yeah. Uh, seven months in the quartermaster, nine months at school. Oh, it was a kind of a checkered career. <laughs> uh, to go on, I enlisted in the Nebraska National Guard in January of 1948. And I stayed in the Nebraska National Guard four years till uh, January of uh, 1952. This was during the Korean War. I was not called. Uh, our unit was not called for the Korean War. However, two of us were accused of being peacetime soldiers, that when the going got tough that we'd get out. My original list in the Nebraska Guard was three years. Me and the other guy enlisted for another year just to say we're not chicken. Good for you. Let me ask you, what's this star? The what's that? What's this? What's this metal here? This uh, bronze star. The bronze star, yeah. Yes, right. now, and it's quite it's, uh, it's with. It. Let me take my. I should explain my yeah, combat it's, it's, infantry badge. Yes. Let me do that okay, first. You got that. Can you? Oops. Like, get it right side up here for you. Now what? That's a combat. Com combat infantry badge. Right. Uh, if you were in combat in infantry, uh, this was worth ten dollars a month more. <laughs> ten dollars a month more. Is that yeah. right? <laughs> well, the PFC overseas, I drew sixty-four dollars yeah. a month. You know. What What was your rank when you got out? Did you PFC? Get, you You were state PFC. All that. is that, that right? A lieutenant insisted to carry that radio, and he wouldn't release me to anything else. He would let you off the hook, would he? I mean, you got a good man doing a job. Right now. Tell us this, about the Bronze Star. This Bronze Star is uh, a, a special award because it's the Bronze Star with V device. The V is for valor. Okay. I was awarded it for heroism in combat the same day I was wounded. Uh, my citation is there in the paper for going back and informing the company commander and leading him back up to the platoon. Yeah, do you want me to read them? Yeah, if, if read your citation. Is your citation on there? Yes. Read it, will you please? I've turned around. I hope you can see it. <laughs> Private First Class John J. Vassa, 3745-6088, 395th Infantry, United States Army, 
for heroic action in connection with military operations against the enemy on 15th of March 1945 in Germany. When attacking the town, the platoon in which Private Vasa was radio operator was hit by fierce resistance. Twice the radio was he was operating was knocked out of his hands by small arms fire and he received shrapnel wounds in the hand. Disregarding his wounds, he dashed into the town with to his platoon and found that the platoon leader was wounded and the platoon suffering many casualties. He received permission to go back through the sniper and machine gun fire to inform the company commander of the situation. The daring initiative are, as the daring initiative shown by Private Vasa led to the eventual routing of the enemy and to the capturing of the town, entered military service from Nebraska. In combat. Okay, go ahead. Tell us what it is. Yeah. It's a little Catholic prayer book. Uh, and I, it is small enough to carry. It is, uh, well, it's given to army troops, but it is, is one that I carried all the time. So that, John, now that picture you're holding there, that's, that's you when you entered the service, is that correct? No, that's in July of 44. July of 44. Okay. Am I too shaky? <laughs> okay, now you go. This is a V-mail that we used to send messages home or letters home. Uh, they were written on the large part and then microfilmed and the uh, small part was the part the person received. Uh, How often did you send those? As often as you could write. They were always had seemed to have plenty of uh, Forms. So, so it was easy for you to do. Yeah. The, the, the other way, though, getting mail into you guys was, was pretty sparse. Was, wasn't yeah. It? I mean, a lot of people didn't even get uh, mail. This could be picked up fairly often. You could send it back with a mess truck or, or whatever. It had to be censored. You can see the censor marks on there. Yeah, they'll mark through stuff, there. yeah. <laughs> so they were not sealed. Of course, that wasn't sealed anyway. Okay, this knife is a German official uh, civilian knife, probably carried by a German Nazi official to show that he had a position in the German civilian uh, government. I uh, obtained it in some house we captured where I picked it up at. Okay, we'll, we'll get it going. Go ahead, The Joe. German civilians that we saw in combat were real industrious people. Uh, they would be raking out tank tracks and cleaning up glass while we were still attacking the town, they uh, didn't waste any time. It was a far different story with the French. Uh, as late as October, when I was in the camp getting ready to come home in France, there were towns that weren't cleaned up yet. It was a, a, a real difference. The mess halls after VE Day, we generally used German prisoners or Russian 
soldiers or Russian displaced persons for kits and help. <coughs> the garbage line would have German children lined up in it. The German children were always clean and neat, well dressed, young, not pushy, standing there with their bucket or pan or can or whatever they had. And I remember especially uh, one mess hall where we'd get oranges from Spain with our noon meal or evening meal. Two little girls with gallon buckets, well dressed, about I would say five, six years old, standing clear at the end of the line. Those poor little girls that end up with more oranges than they could possibly carry home. <laughs> Yet, in October, I went to mess lines in Camp Chicago, which was a, a camp where we waited to get on the boat. Grown French people would push and shove to get your scraps from your mess hall. It was, it was a day between day and night. It was unbelievable. Okay, now you got, uh, you got back to the States and yeah. you mustered out, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then you came, to, and then you came back to Nebraska. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And what did you do then? I went, well, are you recording this? No, no. Well, when I yeah, get back in December, there was no work. Of course, I didn't want to work. It didn't work for a month. But uh, there was no work on the farm. So I went to work. The only place I'd get a job was uh, with the Union Pacific Railroad on an extra gang that was in town. Okay. So I worked at that for six weeks, about six weeks. I could stay in the bunk car for 50 cents a day. A bunk car and room and board for 50 cents a day. On the extra gang. On the extra gang. Yeah. Stay in one of the bunk cars. Uh, my brother was in the Merchant Marine and he had gotten out about the same time. He got a job out at the dam, out at Lake McConaughey. Okay. Out at Kingsley Dam. Right. He was working for a construction outfit out of Kansas City that was paying 90 cents an hour. The railroad was paying 66 and two-thirds cents an hour and no overtime. He was getting nine cents an hour and getting about two hours a night overtime. But he was working the swing shift, four to midnight. Oh. I asked him to get me on out there. He got me on. And I worked out there about six weeks till spring came. And then I rented a half section from my dad and started farming. Started farming, huh? Mm -hmm. So then you farmed and you have a family and... Well, I didn't get married till uh, 1952. Oh, okay. February 52. We've been married 54 years now. Well, congratulations. You got six kids. Uh, when did you move over here? When did I lose it all? Last month or so. No, no. When did you move? When did you move to Colorado? Oh. <laughs> well, originally, I was farming with my brothers in Ogallala. Okay. Uh, there was three of us. It was too much. Might have to put some more. Stuff. So we, uh, I decided to move to. I decided to move out. Uh, first I moved to Longmont, east of Longmont. I was there three years and I farmed there. I bought a farm there. I never worked so hard in my life and accomplished so little. <laughs> so and I finally managed to get it sold with somebody enough money to get me started somewhere else. After I got out of the Army, of course I'd been born and raised on a ranch, uh, my dad gave me a choice. 
of going back up in the hills, the sand hills in Nebraska, on the ranch, or he would buy some more wheat ground and sell the ranch. I guess I had seen too many bright lights to go back up in the hills. It was 38 <laughs> miles to Ogallala. We didn't have telephone. We didn't have electricity. Uh, we had a 32-volt electric plant. It was 12 miles to Arthur, which was nothing. Uh, 38 miles to church. So I said, no, I want to stay down here. So he sold the ranch, we bought some more wheat ground, and I fed cattle with my brothers. I, of course, I was uh, born and raised with cattle, and I fed cattle for, uh, from 1946 till 1965. Oh. Uh, the last three years at Longmont I fed cattle. Uh, when I sold out there and I bought this ground at Holyoke, there wasn't any fences on it, there wasn't any yards. I had put in more money than I wanted to on the land out there, so I decided to get out of the cattle business. Hey, I don't want to be nosy, but what did you pay for an acre of land? Here? At Holyoke? Yeah. I bought this first farm. I bought a half section and I came out and surveyed it because I had my own instrument to see if it would level out reasonable. I paid $200 an acre for one quarter and 175 for the other. Now also at the same time, I bought a half section from George Garland that a quarter of that had an irrigation well on it and he had leveled it. I paid $350 an acre for that and a quarter that he was dry land that he hadn't done anything with yet for 200. 200, yeah. These were, these $200 an acre lands were not irrigated at the time but they had the good potential for irrigation. Circle, yeah. uh, I moved out here in 1965, in the spring of 65, with a hell of a debt load, six kids. Uh, we couldn't afford much help. Lil learned to do a lot of things that she never thought she'd learn how to do. Uh, we had our fun, uh, but I think anybody that started farming in those particular times and with the, with the way the prices went for the next 15 years, uh, unless they really flubbed it, they, they couldn't help but make it. And you could buy a gallon of gas for under 20 cents, a diesel fuel for under 15. Uh, you know, your expenses was way down there. Yeah. Uh, we were, I think in 1967, I got a dollar and a dime a bushel for corn. I sold corn this last fall for a dollar 83. <laughs> And uh, the, the prices just haven't kept up. You know that as well as I do. Take a postage stamp. Yeah. Three cents to 39 cents. Uh, so, but it's, that, it's uh, now land is selling real good. A quarter out there the other day, irrigated quarter, sprinkler on it, 250, no. Three hundred and fifty-five thousand. Yeah, thousand bucks a throw. Well, no more than that. Twenty-four hundred and some odd dollars yeah. an acre. <laughs> but again, like Lil and I are retired, we're living out on the farm. But uh, there's there's no way 
really that we can unload it without taking a real beating. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you got to, that's right. You're going to have such capital gain it'll yeah. kill you. That's right. Um, my one boy basically went broke farming last spring at a sale, and uh, by the time he recovered his depreciation and everything, why it took about thirty percent of it. Oh yeah. So, so I don't know. We've uh, we've enjoyed life. We've had a good life. We've we've got a good family. We don't have any. Uh, anybody in the pen, we don't have anybody uh, divorced, and uh, what else can you ask anymore? So tell, tell me, you got six children, and tell me a little bit about those, are they? Uh... The oldest one is my stepdaughter. Okay. Uh, she is uh, 56 years old. She lives in Wichita Falls, Texas. Our husband is a computer programmer at Wichita State University. Uh, she works for a chemical outfit, a head bookkeeper, uh, does all the ordering and stuff. Uh, my oldest son basically went broke at farming. He moved to Salem, Oregon. He works for West Coast Beet Seed. Some way or another, when he was a little kid, he got impregnated with a beet seed up here, and that's all he knows is beets. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, he's basically a, a field man. He's in charge of all the test plots that the different uh, sugar beet companies send to West Coast beet seed to develop. Oh, okay. He does all the test plot work. Uh, he doesn't do the harvesting. All the bookkeeping on replicated plots and all that uh, development stuff. The daughter, Lisa, is moving to Helena, Montana this week. She went to work for the old Kansas, Nebraska gas company at Yuma. She got a divorce. Uh, she went to work for Kansas, Nebraska at Glenwood Springs when they took over Western Gas. She worked for them in Aspen. The reason she went there because she was the only one that uh, Western Gas didn't know cans method of operation, or their bookkeeping, meter reading stuff. Uh, she eventually got transferred to uh, Lakewood to KN headquarters. She went to night school, college, got her degree in business administration, computer programming. She worked for uh, KN till she saw the handwriting on the wall and it got out. She was getting about 60000 a year there. She went to work for MCI. Uh, of course, you know where they went. They went belly up. Uh, then she went to work for uh, TIAA Craft which is a mutual insurance company, Teachers uh, Insurance and Annuity Association. Uh, she was a computer programmer there. Uh, she didn't like the work, so she quit. She raises cats as a hobby. The kittens that she sells bring $500 apiece. Uh, she's moved to, uh, she remarried. The man she married is from, originally from Montana. He went to work for the state of Montana and she's gotten a job with the state of Montana now. Uh, Michael, 
The next boy, he basically went broke farming. He moved to Sandy, Oregon, which is outside of Portland. He went up there as a manager for a berry farm. Stayed there a year and didn't like it. His wife is a beauty operator. She got her own shop up there, and he's got a real estate license. Uh, he's selling real estate. Uh, Pat went broke. He's working for a farmer south of Holyoke. His wife works for the school system. Uh, Phil is the only farmer I got left. He farms, I don't know, I would say probably 3,000, 3,500 acres, about 1,200 acres of beets, about 1,200 acres, 1,500 acres of beans, and about 2,000 acres of corn. Wow. And then he was doing some custom work, uh, dryland wheat, but I think he gave that up this year. He has three full-time hired men. Way more equipment than I even want to think about. Uh, he borrows way more money than I want to think about, too. <laughs> and that's basically farm, the family. Lil and I still live on the farm. Uh, my hobby, I guess, is, if any, is uh, I am uh, right now president of the 99th Infantry Division Association, which is a veterans outfit of the 99th Division. We have about 2,500 members. We have an annual reunion. Uh, I'm president for this coming term. Our next uh, reunion is in Little Rock. Uh, my other hobby is uh, groundwater. I was on the Groundwater Commission, Colorado Groundwater Commission, for 13 years. I was chairman six years of that time. And I still take a real active interest in water. Good for you. And that about does it.